If you're faced with the daunting task of piecing together a coherent research methodology for your dissertation or your thesis or research project, this video is for you. And it's a little different from our usual content. In this video, we're releasing a recording of our popular Methodology 101 webinar, which has been attended by thousands of students over the last year. The webinar is hosted by one of our trusty coaches, Dr. Karen Warren, and in it, we cover a little bit of everything to get you started piecing together your research methodology. So grab a cup of coffee or tea or whatever works for you, sit back, relax, and enjoy the webinar. Hi, Derek. Thank you for the introduction. Yes, let's start off with a, with a definition or how we're going to be defining research methodology today. And, and I think what's useful is to think about the research methodology as a process that involves what you're doing for your research to help you achieve your aims, your objectives, your research question. In other words, the sort of steps that you're going to be taking to help get some data, get your results, and why you're doing it that way. That's the second thing, why you're doing it that way. So the justifications behind those steps. And we, we don't just mean the justifications as to, you know, well, you know, this is just a, a, a good method for this kind of research, but also how it links to maybe your theory or how it links to, you know, the bigger picture or how the different steps are interconnected. And with this in mind, it's very important to think about the recipe, sorry, not the recipe, the methodology less like a recipe and more like maybe a recipe blog, if you will, maybe a formal recipe blog in the sense that you're not just writing a list of ingredients and a step and stepwise process, but you're also wanting to say why it is that you're doing that. So why is it that you're whipping the egg whites. It's because you're wanting to get some air into the structures of the proteins that make up the egg whites for your souffle in order to, for it to be soft and bouncy and tall. So it's really about the justification behind what you're doing that really needs to be thought about and unpacked. So a research methodology is not just the doing, but there's a thinking element involved there as well that is very crucial for your research to truly make sense. Another set of important criteria to think about is that even though we're going to be defining it this way or using the sort of what and why sort of broader definition for the research methodology, I want you to also make sure that whatever you are doing, check your institutional requirements, your departmental requirements, because some departments are very specific as to what they're wanting from their, from their students, from their graduate students in production of the research methodology and how they want you to think about it. And also what's useful is to look at past dissertations and theses that were ideally published within the context of your department, because dissertations tend to have a lot more detail around that justification element than you would get in, for instance, an article where somebody's maybe done the same series of methods that you've been using in their methodology section. Because a research article is a lot more to the point, it's a lot more around the what, and the editors of those journals tend to just take it for granted that people have done the thinking process. For a dissertation, they're wanting to see your thinking process. You need a lot more of that justification and explanation. So with that in mind, let's consider why the methodology is such a difficult thing. And for me, I think that the methodology is difficult because we get thrown a lot of terms and a lot of terms and names and phrases of various methodologies or methods that can be a part of your process. So when I say method versus methodology, methods tends to be a lot more around a very specific focused the what, if you will, a very specific set of actions, whereas a methodology definitely has a lot more thinking and connection to your theories and your, and your ideas, if you will. And quite often, those terms are used relatively interchangeably, and some dissertations and some research projects or in general, might have many methods and methodologies, not just one, and some will be very focused. Sometimes we're thrown our focus is thrown onto the analysis part of a piece of research rather than the data collection. And sometimes it's thrown onto something a little bit broader. And all of this can be very confusing when you're trying to figure out what it is that you need to do. 
But let's go a little bit backwards and maybe start off with thinking about what is the purpose of the research methodology in general. And for me, I think of two clear things that I want to see in a research methodology that's written up, but not just something that needs to be done in the writing phase, but also in the doing phase. And that is you need a very clear action heavy plan that really details how it is that you're going to be achieving your aims and objectives or what it is that you've done to achieve your aims and objectives. And the research methodology at the end of it all mustn't just achieve and tick that, you know, have a series of tick boxes as to how you've achieved your aims and objectives, but there needs to be some certainty or some level of certainty that the data that you've collected and the results that you've produced are meaningful and that they're and that they're credible in the context of the research that you're doing, which means that if you're doing research uh, using a methodology that is similar to somebody else, that the ways in which you've done it are relatively sound and accepted in that field of research. So with that in mind, you do need to make sure that your research methodology is not completely novel and new, or if it is, that at least you've got a huge amount of justifications as to why that is the case. And it needs to show some kind of connection to the broader research area that you're publishing or doing this research in. But it also needs to make sense. It also needs to produce actual meaningful results that will ultimately be trustworthy and credible and help you really answer your research question in an appropriate way. So to help you with maybe achieving those two things and and to perhaps start this thinking about what it is that you need to do in order to ensure that you've achieved a relatively sound and appropriate methodology chapter, but also that you've done a relatively and conducted a relatively sound and appropriate you know, set of steps, it's important to think about the core components of a methodology. And I want to be very clear that I'm going to be covering four key components that I see quite a lot in a lot of varied disciplines and uh, institutions. But quite often, if you see a methodology chapter, there's not just four sections in that chapter. Some, some chapters even have 11 sections, depending on what the person is doing. So <laughs> a research methodology chapter itself might have a lot of different and alternative and additional considerations that are made. But for me, I like to think of these four as perhaps the most practical sort of, you know, points or foundational points to consider both early on in the phase, but also that help you as the research really consider what it is that you need to do. So let's start off with, with one of them. And that is well, the first one, the top one, and that is the research approach. And so when you see, or if you had to Google what is a research approach, you're probably going to get a bunch of different things. <laughs> and for today's purpose, we're going to really focus it in on, on just a very broad research approach as to thinking about how you're going to tackle and what angle you're going to tackle this research at and in line with the bigger picture. And, and for us, I'm going to sort of focus the research approach on whether your research is going to be words focused, descriptive, maybe a little more exploratory, or whether it's going to involve numbers, right? If you're going to be doing measures, percentages, you know, calculations of some kind. And for some of you, maybe you're wanting a mixture of and typically, that means that your research might be quantitative, numbers focused, or quality, words, descriptions, phrases focused. And as I said before, some of you might choose a mixture of both, in which case your research will be in the mixed methods realm of research approach. And, and so that's the, that's the first and foremost thing to really think about is, do you want a lot of numbers in your research? Does it make sense to have numbers or to use numbers for your research question? Or is it a little bit more aligned with, with something where you're wanting to unpack a series of ideas and, 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 and descriptions and maybe explore a little bit more? In which case, qualitative tends to be a little bit better for that kind of thing. And in the realm of quantitative research, the ways that you, the things that you might consider are whether you're doing surveys where you're wanting to sort of close, have closed 
directly ticked and, you know, see how people would, you know, what the percentage of people who answered a certain way are, or whether you're maybe wanting to interview people and get a little bit of a discussion. But those are more for that next step. So we'll focus a little bit more on that a little bit later. But for now, really ask yourself, is the thing that I'm wanting to get out of this research, a lot of numbers, a lot of, you know, calculations, will that be more meaningful in answering my research question? And is that something I as a researcher feel comfortable doing? Or do I want to sort of sit and unpack a series of ideas? So that's probably the first main question to really hinge your methodology on. And some of the things that might help in terms of questions to help you with this decision is, is my aim, the aim of my research, one around measurements, calculations, correlations, relationships between various things where I can get a number and that number will be something meaningful? Or am I wanting to describe something or explore something? In my literature review chapter, did I make it clear that there needs to be more exploration and description about a specific issue? Another question to help ask you is, or ask is, is the purpose also the aim or your research questions around predicting? Am I going to say that, you know, I want to understand whether piracy is linked to, you know, global warming, for instance, <laughs> in which case you can get like, you know, the level of pirates in the ocean versus, you know, the degree of global warming and, you know, test that from the number and maybe a scatterplot. Or do I want to explain that that link might not actually make very much sense. So do I want to go into detail around that and maybe interview people to help me unpack that a little bit more? Another question that might help is, do I want to, do I, do I see the world and does my research see the world and the, the purpose of my research, wanting to get a single answer, a single number that is very representative of the world at large or do I want to unpack that complexity? And by that, I mean, do I really see the world in a single way, a single answer, a single reality, if you will, that's a little bit more philosophical? Or do I really want to see multiple angles, multiple you know, perspectives of an issue and unpack that a little bit more detailed way? And a fourth one is, does, is there existing theory? Is there a framework that is very mature that I can just use directly and put numbers to it and predict something, for instance? Or do I actually need, or have I argued that there needs to be more theory, more explanation behind this issue at hand? And that brings us, once you've, once you've answered that question, that brings us through to the data collection phase. So now, now that you know, maybe do I want to explain something, explore something, describe something, or do I want to sort of measure something and predict something? Now that I know whether I'm doing a more qualitative, quantitative, or mixture sort of project, how do I even get the data for this? And in that way, data collection is important. And data collection is really what data you're going to be looking at in order to help you maybe achieve your aims and how you're going to be collecting it. And quite typically, especially if you're doing the social sciences or you're working with people or doing some kind of business research or education research, the options tend to be around surveys and interviews. Surveys being a lot more closed where you can get the percentages and proportions and numbers associated with people's feelings and whether they agree with something or disagree with something. And interviews being a lot more sort of one-on-one -on -one where you sort of unpack what they've said and sort of go into a little bit more depth around uh, and have a discussion that is maybe recorded. And that's how you collect your data. So the surveys and interviews tend to be the two more common uh, data collection methods that I seem to see. And things that are really important to consider there is that you need to be able to do it. It needs to be practical. You need to be able to do it and still get people. You need to you know, know who it is that you're probably going to get. You need to have the appropriate equipment, et cetera, et cetera. So it needs to be doable. And it needs to help answer your research question. And it needs to align with your research approach. So if you said that you're going to be doing a quantitative piece of research and you're doing interviews, that might ring a few alarm bells unless you sort of very much justify how those interviews are going to give you some numbers. And so ultimately, this data collection technique needs to really follow through from your research question, your research approach, and must give you data and results that is fundamentally helpful and meaningful to answer your research question.
So as I said before, the two ones that we tend to get quite a lot of is the quantity up on the quantitative side is the our surveys, and from the qualitative side are interviews. Typically, what we call semi-structured interviews, which means you go into the interview with a set of prepared questions that like sort of help you navigate the conversation that you have with your interviewee but you do allow some room for the interviewee to drive parts of the conversation and to get new things and as you can see and in this in this table that for both of those things there are some con there are some considerations you can see under the cross-sectional survey which means a survey collected at one point in time that this person is using survey which is an online tool to help you uh, send out your survey that people were notified via email. So people were told to respond to the survey through an email that they were sent. That there's a survey instrument, which is just a fancy way of saying that there is an existing survey that you used or modified in order to make your research questions more aligned with the questions that the respondents are seeing and the way that they're um, going to be answering it. There's some survey details, which means maybe you've broken up the survey into several components that perhaps need to be fleshed out. And we probably also want to think about how long that survey is out for and whether you're sort of collecting any follow-ups. The qualitative side, you can see over here, this person conducted the, the interview over Zoom. It was recorded. They went in with a little interview guide that maybe they linked in their appendix in their final dissertation. Maybe the interview was about 45 minutes long and that they might have sent the interviewees a check in once, you know, once the interview was over to ask them if they have any thoughts after the fact. And so in many contexts, there's a lot of details that really need to be considered and unpacked, even if you know what the broader method is for either of those kinds of strategies. In mixed methods, you then need to unpack both strategies, especially if you're using both a survey and an interview, you need to unpack them both in some details. But we also want to know which was first, were they conducted at the same around the same time? What is the link between the two? But you also probably want to, you know, flesh out in a little bit more detail. So with those details, those little bits and pieces, how do you consider them? Well, I firstly personally first think about the general method, right? Am I doing a survey or am I doing an interview? And once you've done that, you're going to ask yourself, well, what tools do I need? Do I need SurveyMonkey? Do I need a recorder? Do I need all of these little bits and pieces that will help me secure the data from, you know, the survey or the interview or what have you? How will I distribute this? How will I get, like, you know, respondents to these things? And should I consider maybe the phases in the research and the time that it takes to conduct this research that it's not too time consuming and that I can finish my degree in time, if you will? So those are considerations that you might want to make during the data collection phase. Hey, Derek here again. I wanted to quickly jump in to tell you about our free research methodology chapter template. If you're in the process of crafting your methodology chapter or section, this template will help you structure your thinking and fast track your writing. If you're interested, you can find the free download link in the description. All right, back to the webinar. So the third core component that is worth considering is that of sampling strategy. And in many ways, the sample that you're dealing with is just the, it's just the who, the what, the, you know, and where you're going to be collecting your data from, right? So for if your population or the group that you said that you're going to be working with are nurses in India, then your sample needs to comprise of nurses in India and you need to be relatively certain that this group that you've that you that you've you know brought into your own research is going to tell you what nurses in India broadly actually think about the certain issue or how uh, you know at hand. So you need to make sure that the sample is relatively representative of the context that you're trying to unpack. Maybe you realize that maybe India is maybe such a big country that you're wanting to focus in on a specific uh, province in India, in which case that is still appropriate, but you need to go back to your research question and make sure that that's clear. So in other words, your sample needs to in some way help you answer your research question within the context that you have already said that you're going to be looking through and at. And there are certain considerations that you need to make 
in the context of your research method, the data collection method that you're using, as well as within the context of your research question. So one thing to consider is, is your sample truly representative? And for quantitative research, the strategy is usually to have a large enough sample size so that you know that the trends that you're getting is relatively representative of the general sample. You also probably want a broad enough so you're wanting to maybe collect from multiple areas or multiple regions within area to make sure, within India to make sure that it's relatively representative. In qualitative research, it's probably better to actually hone in your research question and having a smaller population to deal with might give you richer results at a, at a more smaller level. So in many contexts, how your sample represents the broader population or the context of, of interest is very important. Sample size is really brought into that. You need a larger sample size in quantitative research, otherwise your data might not be, make a lot of sense. And that's just the nature of quantitative analyses really, is that the more you have, the more certain you are that your results are accurate. For qualitative research, that's not, that's not practical. You just cannot interview dozens and dozens and dozens of people. And you probably start finding in maybe an interview, if that's your qualitative strategy, that actually there's this too, that you get the same kinds of responses over a certain time and that you get enough out of just a smaller handful or smaller group of people. And we've got some common methods here. We're not gonna go into any details there, but those are some of the key areas to think about. And here are some sampling strategies that you can maybe Google if you have some time. So with that in mind, it's important to consider firstly, who is going to be a part of your, your sample? What are you, who are you going to include and who are you not going to include? Are you only going to be focusing on female nurses, for instance, or nurses within a specific province? Second, what is your sample size? Quantitative research needs a larger sample size in order to be more certain that your data is relatively powerful and accurate. And the third thing is how will you get these people? We haven't really touched on them, but you really don't want to be in a situation where now you've made your sample decision, but you have never been to India and you don't know any Indian nurses and you don't know how to access them, in which case that's going to be a bit of an issue. So how are you going to access these people or your sample or your you know, group of trees if you're doing research in ecology and you're not dealing with people? How are you going to get this to the, these people or these, these things to be part of your research. So in the fourth and final component, and this is a component that I always see people, they, they, they tend to get a little bit limp at this stage, and that is the data analysis stage of the research. And the methodology chapter tends to, it tends to be a little bit smaller, and that's a bit of a pity because the data analysis is truly what are you going to do once you've collected the data, once you've gotten your survey back, once you've gotten a large enough sample size, what are you going to do with that? And same with the interviews. Now that you've sat through the interviews and listened to everyone speak, what are you going to do with their words? <laughs> How are you going to understand and turn those words and those numbers into something meaningful that helps you answer your research question? And that is essentially what the data analysis is, is turning your data into results that help you answer your research question. And in many ways, that actually involves taking quite a lot of information and reducing it and simplifying it into, info, into meaningful bite-sized pieces that really help you achieve what you set out to achieve for your own research. And with that in mind, there are a lot of choices that you need to make in the data analysis phase. The first and foremost is what, what technique are you going to be using? What data analysis method are you going to be using? For qualitative research, you might decide that you're going to be doing some form of thematic analysis where you're going to be taking all of this, all of these interview transcripts and words that people have sent to you, and you're going to turn them into maybe three or four key themes that can really help you understand your research. For for quantitative research, you might decide that you have some hypotheses you're going to test or some predictions that you're going to be making, and now you're going to be using t-tests or regressions to help you get a number that really corresponds to, yes, 
this prediction was accurate or no, this prediction was not accurate. And then the next consideration is the software you're going to be using. So very at this point in time, very few people sort of write everything out and do the analysis by hand. So software has become a very important part of analysis, analytical processes. Are you, for your statistics, going to be using a software like SPSS? Are you going to be keeping it in Excel and keeping it maybe a little bit more descriptive? For qualitative research, are you going to be using a helpful tool like Inviva to help you make sense of the interviews that you have conducted or not? Other considerations that might end up being their own sections, if they end up being big enough, is how can you be sure that the data you got was trustworthy and valid and reliable? And for quantitative research, that might involve some more statistics and some more analytical techniques. And for qualitative research, that means really unpacking whether you can really trust what what you have done and what kinds of themes or, or answers you have produced from this research. So those are some things to consider. And then for mixed methods or multi-methods approaches where you have not just one, but maybe more methods, how are you going to bring them together? How are they going to sort of, how are you going to compare the results from those different methods? And that's called triangulation. So those are some key considerations to be made during this data analysis phase. Technically, try to make them before the data analysis phase has begun, because that will really help drive whether what you're doing is appropriate. But, but those are some key considerations that you should, that you con should consider in your research. And so, yeah, there are, again, what software do you need? Another really important thing is, is if you're not a statistical person, and yeah, you are saying that you're going to be running a few regressions, do you need to learn how to run a regression? Do you need to learn how to understand those results? So do you need to upskill in some way? And then, of course, how do you ensure that your data is relatively reliable and trustworthy and meaningful in the broader academic context? So with all that in mind, let's look at an example. And I'm going to be using this example of what is the role of high school leadership in developing learner confidence? Let's pretend that that is our, uh, that is our research question. And for this, we need, probably in the context of what is the role, I would say qualitative research will be very good here because a role is a very difficult thing to define. So unless there's been a lot of theories that you're going to be using and measuring directly, I would say I'd probably approach this from a more qualitative angle. Data collection. With angle, I'll probably be personally wanting to conduct some interviews, maybe with high school leaders in some way. So maybe some principals and vice principals or, or what have you that are currently working in a high school environment. The sampling strategy, though that would probably be, you know, through those interviews, as I said, it would be uh, high school principals and uh, vice principals. And once I've interviewed, maybe I would say, let's say about 10, 15 people should be more than enough. That would probably represent at least six schools. So I really get a sense of a broad array of different kinds of high school teachers. Then in that context, now I can start analyzing the data. I've sat through the interviews. I've maybe recorded the interviews. I've taken those recordings and I've transcribed them so that they're written down. And I started using a software like Invivo to maybe help me turn those into themes through the process of thematic analysis. And once I've got those themes, let's say that those the roles are for developing learner confidence is to first create a safe environment in the school. Maybe that is a theme that comes up quite often. Maybe another theme that came up in the interviews was to make sure that the teachers are focusing on more than just the grades in the classes and to really help empower the teachers to do a little bit more than that. Maybe that's another thing to empower teachers. So as you can see, I'm starting to get a bunch of roles that are aligned to the themes that come from the interviews from the high school leadership itself. And so once I start thinking about this as a, you know, the, the process that, that I need to conduct in order to get those that answer to that question, I can start seeing how these four steps really start flowing together. So with this in mind, what are they looking for? And there's in quotations, because they could be your I or your uh, supervisor, they could be, you know, perhaps, you know, your committee or what have you, and they're reading your chapter, or it could be ethics approval if you're going to be sending your methodology uh, chapter through to them. 
And for me as an academic, I tend to look for three key things in a research methodology chapter that shows me that this person really thought out this process. The first thing is that your methodology needs to align with your research questions, aims, and objectives. If you make that clear how your method help or your methodology helps you achieve that, then that's very good. We call that the golden thread, that there was connection between what you did and what you set out to do. The second thing they look out for is your methodological details are clear. And the rule of thumb is that I, as somebody who's outside, could technically repeat what you have done. And maybe I won't get the exact same results, but I would have done exactly what you have done and ideally would have achieved something relatively similar to what you have shown as well. So your methodological details need to be clear in order for me as another researcher to truly be able to understand what it is you've done and to maybe even repeat it myself. And the third thing that they're looking for is that your justifications are convincing. So the methodology that you've done that, that you said that you're going to be doing, does it align to the theory that you brought up in your literature review? Does, does doing it this way, is it, does it really make sense? Does, does it really help you achieve meaningful results in the broader research field that can be, you know, that can be trustworthy and that will be appropriate? So are your justifications clear, convincing, and appropriate for what it is that you are doing? So now, with all that in mind, how do you get started? Like, how do you even how do you even bring all this together? And we're going to be we're going to be touching on several several key points. But I think I think the most important thing that you can get out of this is that you need to start with your research question. If you don't have a research question, if you have aims and objectives, that's fine. But you need to start off with chapter one, the first thing that you set out to do, answering your research question. How is it? that I can best answer my research question should be first and foremost. The second thing you're probably wanting to do is to look at what other people have done. So other people who've asked similar questions to you, how have they answered this question? And some, some fields of research might have a wealth of different ways in which people have answered a question like yours. Maybe, maybe the, some of them have answered it through surveys and some of them have answered it through ethnographies and some of them have answered it through interviews and some of them, in which case you've got a lot more choice, but really ask yourself what really aligns with what I'm trying to do and how have other people tried to do it? And do I feel that I need to do it this way or that way based on what they have said what, um, and what I'm perhaps wanting to show? Do I really feel that I need to take a step back and do something more qualitative because I don't, I'm not convinced that perhaps what they have done is suitable for my context and I need to really unpack this context in a little bit more detail or this group with a little bit more detail, which guys, even though there are surveys available, I'm going to be doing an interview. So look at the existing research and give it a think and justify why it is that, you, that you're drawn to perhaps certain methods. But then you have to think about the practical elements. And this actually, no matter what, what is the best possible method or methodology to use and what really helps you achieve your, your question, if you can't do it for some reason, maybe the equipment that you need is too expensive and not available, maybe the a longitudinal or, or time-consuming research is not appropriate if you have to hand in in three months. Maybe your research your research department doesn't want you to collect primary data. Maybe they want you to only collect secondary data. Data, in which case you can't do an interview. You have to look at what is available already, perhaps on the internet or in books or what have you that is already available for you to use, rather than collect yourself. So you need to think about the practical elements and make sure that you can do what it is that you're needing to do. Then fourth, ask yourself what you need to learn in order to be able to do this. Do you need to learn some stats? Do you need to understand the process of thematic analysis in a little bit more detail? How are you going to upskill? Do you need to take an online course? Maybe you need to take um, an in-person course that is available in your at your institution in order to help you upskill. And then finally, start mapping out your methodology chapter. Nothing indicates to you more what you don't know than seeing those gaps in what you're trying to, you know, write out. So if you don't know an aspect of your methodology, ask yourself to perhaps 
you know, try and find out how you can fill that gap, how you can maybe get a little bit more detail in there. So actually start writing your methodology chapter because it will really help you understand what it is that you know and what it is that you don't know and to start creating a really clear plan for yourself. And with that in mind, once you've done these five things and considered these five things, hopefully you'll be ready to start to start your actual research and to actually start answering your research question, which is a wonderful, fun place to be. All right, so that wraps up the Research Methodology 101 webinar. Remember, we've got a ton more free resources over on the Grad Coach blog to help you crack the methodology code. As always, you can find the links to those in the description. If you enjoyed the webinar, please do remember to hit the like and subscribe buttons and be sure to check out this video next. I'll see you there.